Hi, welcome to the channel and welcome to the second series of the system design for front-end engineers. Today's problem, we will try to design the well, very popular platform for sharing images. It's called, it's called Pininterest. Uh, so what is the Pininterest? Uh, Pininterest is the application where you can share images and GIFs uh, in the style of the pins. So it's like a small card with a different height and it's so, so they all are actually placed in the layout called Mansory layout or Mansory grid. Uh, as you can see, when we scroll down, we load more pins there. Okay, so let's try to design it. As usual, we start with the, uh, the plan of our design. And the general plan uh, is going to be like that. So definitely, we start from you. You start your interview with the collecting the requirements for your system design. So the first thing to do is the general requirements. Uh, the second thing is the uh, functional requirements. So functional requirements actually are the platform we support, uh, what is the target browsers and, and so on. So you have to uh, ask your interviewer for, for that because uh, this is very important and based on that we can adopt our design stuff. So we, uh, when we collected all the requirements we need to start uh, componentize our application to split it into the set of components and I'll call this like the component architecture. Uh, so the fourth point that I'd like to mention is that uh, we need to describe the mensary layout that the pin interest has. How we would implement this in the real world, and so, and this is I think this is the most important step here. Uh, your interviewer can ask you to focus on like component architecture, or you can ask like uh, explain the mensary layout of the. Uh, pin interest stuff. What else we have? Uh, so we finish with that, and then we can uh, so we can proceed with the API description. So uh, for that, we need to to understand which entities we need. So I'll call it data entities. We work with the front end on the front end side. Then we describe the API API we work with. And the seventh the seventh point is the uh, data store and layers. What this means? It's actually how we store this data on the front end side. How can how we access it and where we access it? And I'll explain why it's why it's important later. So eighth point here is that we finished actually working with the uh, so with the whole data, and we now need to focus on the optimization stuff how we optimize our application in order to uh, give the best performance for user and the accessibility. So accessibility it's about the making your application accessible for a wide range of people with the different disabilities like color blindness and so on. Uh, on the interview your interviewer can for can ask you focus uh, either on optimization or accessibility stuff. So you need to be prepared for both. Okay, let's start with our plan. Uh, the first thing to do is the collect the general requirements. So the general requirements for our application is that uh, I'd like to focus on the mensary layout. And so the pins, uh, pins should be in the format of, uh, pins should be placed in the mensary layout grid. This is the first and obvious requirement. Pins should In the form of the man's really out. Okay, uh, so what what it is the second point? Uh, definitely, we can uh, we can say that uh, user can uh, so user can see the pins like we can hover on it and click and see the full details. Full details of pins. 
also I'd like to mention that uh, pin can be like GIF or picture, but but it's not a video stuff. So uh, we don't have a video stuff. We can also say that the user can post the comments and user can share in the theme. About the fourth and fifth point, uh, it depends. Uh, basically, well, if your interviewer uh, asks you just to focus on the menstrual layout, then you need to focus on it because uh, you, you have a very limited time frame to describe this. So we've collected basically the general requirements. Some of them actually is overhead, uh, but it's good to have them all. So, okay, let's go to the functional requirements. Uh, what can be the functional requirements? For example, uh, it depends on the platform you support. For example, if you support the electronic application, then it's definitely you have the Chrome platform. And with the Chrome, you basically forget about all the uh, compatibility issues and so on. But uh, in the Pinterest example, we work with the most of the browsers. I think we can say, well, we can add the restriction that we have, we do not support E11. So, but we support uh, browsers. Um, I think we can, we can say that, uh, we can say that we support like 95% of the browsers we have, except the E11. Okay, what else we have? Uh, so the layout should, so we support wide range of the devices. Support wide range of devices. What this means? So we want to see the application on the iPad, tablets, uh, like mobile phones, smartphones, and so on. So uh, we say that we actually have an adaptive design here. Okay, um, what else can we add to the functional requirements? One point can mention here that we also can, uh, we support offline mode. This means that uh, when we loaded some pins and images and we want to access the application offline, uh, we can use the progressive web app uh, mode here in order to show the, to show for the user the pins here you already load it, uh, for example, when he doesn't have any internet connection. And we also can add that we want, we want the app to work even in a short network band, network band. For example, the user has the internet connection, which is, which is pretty bad, and we want to optimize our app so it could work even on the bad internet connection there. Okay. Uh, we've collected actually all the requirements here and I'll label it so we can quickly see uh, where we have everything. So I'll make it a bit bigger here and this is the functional requirements. Okay, so the next point we are going to work is the components architecture. Okay, uh, components architecture. So the components architecture is how we represent our application in a set of the components. Uh, and we start with the general mockup of our, uh, of our application. And basically we have the grid, like mensual layout. It has the several sizes. In my example, we have the uh, three sizes like L, M, and S. Um, basically, in the real world application, you will have more. Uh, but for just for your system design interview, I think the three sizes is fine. And it contains the pins. Um, and we need and now we need to describe the components we have here. Uh, basically, if your interviewer asks you to componentize everything, we, we need to describe every, uh, like every component here. Uh, probably, the interviewer will ask you to focus on some 
specific stuff, but we are going to see like the broad uh, the broad side of the picture. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna do everything here. Uh, okay, let's start with the pin itself. Uh, what actually is the pin? So the pin is the component which uh, opens, uh, especially the hover. So actually, uh, if you hover in it, you see that the, it's a picture. It's a, it has some menu like link, share, menu, and also drop down with the specific actions. Also, when you want, for example, if you click on this pin, you open the full information with the like the with the details of this pin. Right? It can has some additional description. It can also has comments and it contains the same picture here. And we can say that it opens on click. And now we see actually uh, what the components we have. We have the picture, we have the menu, else we have the drop down, we have the details uh, box, we also have the comments. And we can dive even deeper and describe how actually the comments look like. And for the comments itself, uh, it's pretty simple here. Uh, we can describe it as the comment list where we have the show more button in order to load more comment stuff. And also we have the comment input. As you can see, we don't have any media stuff. We can add any pictures to the comment and the comments are actually pretty simple there here. And with that, uh, I think we can start building the hierarchy of our components. What is the hierarchy? Uh, the schema, it's actually the dependency graph uh, where we can see how each component depends on each other. And this is very useful when you plan your data flow inside the application. Okay, let's uh, start working on that. I have already prepared the schema. Uh, so basically we have the, oh, I don't know what is happening here, but we need to make the text a, a bit smaller. Okay, mm -hmm. this is fine. Uh, so basically you have the high level schema of your application. Uh, in the in the top of that is the application route, and you have the router. How you navigate through all the all your pages here, and then you have like additional components like home controls, profile controls, header, and so on. We won't focus on it, so it's just for demonstration purposes. And the main thing we want to focus is uh, pins feed page. So pins feed page contains with of the pins grid, and the pins grid has the pins. Uh, as you can see, the pin itself also consists of the smaller components, and we can describe it as the as the schema. So we have the pin, pin, uh, pin controls, pin menu, and pin picture. Also, the pin uh, components also opens the full window uh, of the component detail stuff, uh, and the component detail is also can be represented as the schema. So I also placed the arrow here. So the detail components contain of the pin comments, pin details, and pin picture. And now we see the whole dependency graph and how we are going to work with our data. Um, and we can say that we pretty much finished with the components uh, architecture and how we like in the hierarchy of it. And I can place the label of this. Okay, I already have it actually. And we can start thinking about the uh, mensory layout implementation. Uh, okay. I think I'll do this here. So what is uh, the mensory layout? As you can see, the pins has the special style of how they placed uh, on each other. Let's try to describe it and, and actually work with the data, uh, how, we load, how we load more data and so on. Okay, I'll create a next label. Oops. And I'll call this uh, mensory layout. So the mensory layout will, will be here. Okay, uh, let's start working on that. Uh, 
by default, we have the next schema for that. Uh, let me check. Okay, here. And I think I can make it a bit smaller. Just a bit. Okay. So this is our the browser window. Uh, the content height represents the whole content uh, of the browser. We have the several zones here and several important things. Uh, th first thing I'd like to mention that we have the top sentinel and the bottom sentinel. This actually the edges of our content. The, they are represented the beginning and the end of the content we have. By default, we load it. Uh, the we have the two column uh, style grid here and we load it uh, eight pins there. Uh, also, this uh, uh, window consists of the several zones. The first zone is the visible zone. It's actually the report of the user, what the user currently see. We also have the invisible zone, like pin seven and in pin eight, they are rendered inside the browser, but we don't see that because we are actually uh, currently not scrolled down uh, the viewport. And we also have the recycle zone. What is the recycle zone? It's actually the future data. When you open the Pinterest website, uh, you can see that your, uh, your scroll is actually increasing in sizes. Um, it's, uh, so well, when it increases, it's an application load more data. But there is one caveat here. We do not render this data. We just increase the future content size I mean, we increase the canvas size uh, by the size we loaded the data. This means that uh, this zone, the recycle zone, is going to be uh, is going to be increasing uh, with the content with the content loading. Okay, uh, let's say that uh, this is the first step. We just loaded the uh, we just loaded the app, and then we can proceed to the uh, to the scrolling. Okay, the second step would be uh, to scroll this down. So we scroll this uh, little box of the visible zone to the bottom here. So what actually changed? Uh, from that point, nothing much happened here. We just moved the visible zone to the edge of the bottom sentinel, but we didn't intersect with that. Uh, how we check the intersection? The, inter well, the intersection is checked with the observe, uh, intersection observer API. So when the visible zone is going to touch the bottom sentinel, we're going to change, um, uh, to change our visible data. And let's describe this step too. So this was the step two. And this first step is to change the uh, the first step is to change the viewport to the uh, of the visible zone uh, to load more data. So let's so this is step three. So we moved our zone to the bottom sentinel here. First thing which is going to happen is that we intersect uh, the old bottom sentinel. This means that we need to render a new content. So we destroyed the old pin 1 and pin 2 nodes, not actually destroyed, but we removed this from the top and then we, uh, we replace these nodes with the new data uh, of pin 9 and pin 10. And how this actually is happening? Uh, our data represented in the format of the sliding window and the sliding window actually is, can be represented like a uh, two-side stack. Uh, by so on the first step we had pin one and pin eight, but when we triggered the load, we popped uh, the data of this window for, of p one and p two and pushed the new data to to uh, to render. And how this is going to work? Uh, so we pushed we changed the state of our application. So this actually notes are uh, not visible anymore. And why we just remove only pin one and p two? This actually happened because we want to uh, also provide, like, uh, to fix the case if the user scrolls, scrolls down and scrolls up fast, 
and do not re-render each of this uh, small movement of the scroll. That's why we are remo removing only the pins, which is actually quite have the long way for, from the viewport. And we do not remove the pin 3 and pin 4 because they are actually very near to the viewport and we want to, to fix the case if the user like doing like this, scrolls down, scrolls, uh, scrolls up. Um, so these nodes are getting removed and we replace them with the pin 9 and pin 10. But how actually they are getting removed? This is a good question. Uh, inserting operation and also deleting operation from the DOM tree is very expensive stuff, and we need to provide the right, uh, like the right thing to uh, how we can do that. For that, uh, the pin interest, like the real implementation of the pin interest, is using the absolute canvas here. Absolute canvas is represented by the whole content, so the whole container represent. So each pin is actually absolutely positioned here, and. If the position is described very simple. Uh, so by default we start with the uh, translation zero and then when we go down to the next pins we increase the translation by the size of the translation of the pin one plus the margin stuff. Or the margin means that the, play, uh, the space between the vertical space between pin one and pin three. And actually the whole the whole grid is uh, uh, has the style of the uh, just a simple flex row, so the whole data flow can be represented like this. So we have the so we have the flow like we render the pin one, pin two, then we go to the next row and so on. So this is the data flow, or and the render flow. And we exactly know uh, which size of the grid we have based on the viewport. If it's uh, so, it can be four uh, four grid layout. It can be eight grid layout. But we can always know that uh, we need to take the translation of the pin from the previous row, and this is how it's going to be represented. If we want to have like pin five, then we take the uh, translation of the pin five. And why actually this uh, works well? Um, basically. This works well because we are using the absolute position and absolute positioning with the, the with the translation stuff doesn't trigger any reflows and browser triggers because it's on the um, so it's actually on the painting uh, on the painting layer all the browser just need is to replace the pixels on the user side it, it doesn't trigger any reflow of the whole page and this is very performant we can also say that. Uh, the pin one and pin two actually not getting removed. They getting their data is replaced with the new pieces of data of pin nine and pin ten. So we just move them uh, to the to the position of the pin nine and pin ten. And we also, uh, as you can see, move the when we touch the old, old border like old bottom sentinel, we moved it by the size of the. So we have, uh, but we moved it by the size of the new data. Uh, and this is actually uh, so it's getting moved uh, to the bottom and the, the position is also changed I think it's wrong here and it should be uh, here and the, zone, and the zone should be here yeah this is the mistake here Okay, we replaced our old uh, sentinel, and when we scroll down to the new to the new bottom sentinel, we you know, we are repeating the operation, replacing the node three and four you know, with the data of the node eleven and twelve, and move, uh, changing its position to uh, to the to the new position based on the previous pins. So if we scroll up, we are repeating this operation, uh, but in a different way. This means that we push the data to the beginning and removing from the end. And this is the whole uh, the whole implementation. And why it works even for a different uh, height style, um, this is pretty simple to explain. Let's take the grid size. So 
uh, even the, if the pins have the different height, we we position this based on the uh, based on the translation of uh, the previous pin. So we don't we don't care about the like the pins uh, the pins height at all. It can be different, but we always know that we place it just right after the pin from the previous flow. This is why how it works, and this is actually how it looks like on the real world pin interest side. Okay, I think we described the mainstream layout pretty well here, and we can place the label that it's actually the mainstream layout. Yeah, it took quite a while from us, uh, but uh, we can now uh, move on to the data entities we work with. Okay, let's go. Let's proceed and uh, and go to the data entities. So data entities. Uh, probably on the interview you won't focus on this, uh, but uh, we still. Uh, on this video, we still want to do that just for practicing purposes. Uh, we don't know what actually will interview say to you. Uh, so let's let's see what we, which entities we need. It's definitely the it's definitely the comment there. Uh, not comment, but pin entity. And let's also increase the size of it. So we have the pin. And what what we need to work with it, we have an idea of the pin. We also have the origin of the pin. Origin means that uh, what the source of this pin. This can be the uh, usually this is the pin board. We have the description. We have the title, and we have the image URL. And we have the offer. We also need a comment entity because usually uh, in contains comments. Uh, we can load this separately or we can load this uh, together with the pin, but I prefer to load this data separately. So we have the comment and it contains the offer. ID and the content. I think that's it. We have the user. Uh, user is user here is pretty simple. It has the ID and it has the nickname. And it's all what we need uh, to design everything. Let's describe the API. So the API. Mm, what actually we need to load our data. So basically this we have two main endpoints. It's uh, get pins. Uh, so it takes a API key. It also takes the uh, user ID in order to indicate the user which we need to load data for. Uh, it can also have like optional parameters include comments. We can also can have um, uh, instead of user ID, for example, we can load uh, uh, the pins from the pin board, but uh, for the ministry layout, we don't need this. Uh, let's focus on our main use case here. So in field comments, what else we can have here is that we need to somehow indicate uh, the data we want to load. Uh, so we need to timestamp cursor. So if we provide the cursor, this means that uh, from that point of the timestamp, we need to load more, uh, uh, more data. We can also provide the uh, we can also provide the max like the mean ID. For example, we have uh, loaded one thousand pins, 
and 100 news uh, is actually coming, uh, we can indicate that the mean ID uh, we have is 1000 and this indicates for the backend that we need to load the IDs from 1000 to 1100. Uh, okay, I think this is enough and the second endpoint I'd like to have is the get comments. And usually this is the API key and the pin ID. And that's, I think that's all we need. We also can have the page size. And I think that's it for, for us. Okay, we have the API. And let's go to our plan. Well, the next thing to do is the describing the data layers and data store, actually how we work with the data on the front-end side. Uh, so for that, I've prepared already the schema, uh, how this would look like uh, on our stuff. So I will place it here, near the data API. So what we can see from this schema. So we're describing the data layers and how we work with this data, how we pass this data for our components. And I'll also label it on the schema. So let's describe the fetching points, where we fetch the data and ask for this data from the API. Uh, definitely this is the pins fiend page and this is the route where we're actually get, getting the new pins. So we are fetching data and then store it inside the front-end storage. But how can we store the front-end uh, data efficiently? Uh, in the front-end world we prefer to store the data in normalized form in the flattened, for in the flattened format. What is the flattened format? It's actually a very efficient structure like map key where we have the key as the uh, key represented by the ID of the entity and we can access by this ID uh, lots of like different data stuff. So in order to access, for example, uh, pins of the user, we can say that we provide the user ID and then we access the, whole, uh, the array pins by just an ID. If we need to, to have the user, we access it by user ID and we have the user entity and so on for the comments. So for example, if we want to have the we want to have the comments, we access it by the pin ID. And that's how we store the data. We don't want to have multi-level like uh, data on the front end side because it's hard to access and very costly to access. So we write the data in normalized form and then access this data. Uh, so when we have the pins feed, we actually uh, access all IDs we have for on the front end side, who uh, pass these IDs to the pin, and this pin access our store by pin ID and getting the data with the comments and also the, like the pin data, and that's how we work on the front end side, how we store our data and render this efficiently. I think that's it for the data storage, and we can now focus on the performance stuff and I'll create a new label and say, say that this is the performance. And as usual, the performance consists of the three main thing. It's a network performance. I'll make it a bit smaller. And the second thing is the rendering performance. And the third thing is JavaScript performance. So let's focus on each of these points. So we start with the network performance. 
the first thing to do in our application is the asset visiting. So we have the binary data represented like in CSS, JavaScript, and HTML. And we can apply the zipping assets, and this will give us uh, about like 40, 50 percent uh, of zipping the resources and loading this cluster. Then we can go even farther in the for for the data uh, apply the for the browser which support this format apply the Brotl. Brotl is the modern format for from the Google team. It's actually can give us about 10 to 20 percent more uh, asset zipping. So we can also save uh, save a bit of the space to load so, and the traffic just by applying the Brotl. And this things is very uh, cheap to do for us. So we applied the asset zipping. What else can we do in order to have better low resource loading? We, ha we can apply the HTTP2. So uh, ser serving from the server which supports the HTTP2 uh, is very beneficial. It supports the multiplex in the data. And why we actually, in the front end, we wanted to have the one bundle for the whole application and why we strived to do that because uh, the whole, uh, most of the servers doesn't, uh, didn't support the uh, HTTP2 and in the modern web, uh, most of the servers actually support the HTTP2 and there is no restriction on the connection size. I mean, in HTTP1, we had, to, we had no multiplexing and we tried to overcome this by using the five connection of the uh, HTTP1 protocol with HTTP2 under one connection, we can load in parallel like 100 resources. And we don't need uh, so, and we can load our stuff faster just by uh, applying the proto this protocol with the parallel loading and there won't be any five connections. So this is very good to have. Uh, what this actually gives us that we can split uh, the, uh, our application into many bundles and load uh, with the images and stuff very fast. So we uh, first thing we do, we use the bundle sizes. So we can have the vendor bundle. It's for the libraries we have. Uh, so we, it fastly get cached and usually it's not uh, changes a lot and uh, this getting cached on the browser side and we can say that it's not loaded very often. Also we can have like the pin, uh, pin grid. So the pin, uh, the pin grid stuff uh, is also a separate bundle. It represents the whole pin page, uh, 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 like the pin layout uh, JavaScript. Also, we can split the analytics, some utilities, uh, not useful one. Usually, which this code loads uh, later um, because we don't need it like right away. Uh, the second thing is analytics. Oops. So, analytics stuff, what else can be split? Uh, I think that's almost enough here. Uh, what else can we add? Uh, okay, uh, the next thing uh, which uh, is the images. So we can serve our images in the efficient format like WebP. Uh, it's mostly supported by the modern browsers and give us a big traffic uh, benefits uh, for the user. And we also uh, fall back to the PNG in case we uh, do not so, so if the browser do, doesn't support this. Uh, this can uh, actually we can make this even better. How can we make this better? Uh, for that we can apply. So in our application, usually we don't need to have. So in our application, uh, the images. Uh, we don't need to load the whole image like for a small device like mobile phone. We don't want to have the uh, this whole size uh, whole size of it. And I think I had this prepared this schema, but I can't find it right now. Oh, I see, I found it. Okay. So we have the pin, 
and this bin can we can have the separate image optimization service where we can uh, send the image URL plus, plus its viewport by encoded by the uh, query params and some other stuff uh, and this image service returns the optimized image exactly for the user viewport and we can make it even better by applying the CDN's cache so the CDN cache uh, caches all the uh, resources and we don't even trigger the opti image optimization service because once image is optimized it gets cached by CDN and served from the uh, best location for the user and this enables like the powerful stuff we always adapt uh, the image exactly to the user viewport and this uh, this is very uh, like this is cool stuff to do okay uh, we talked about the images uh, let's say that we what else can we add in order to improve the network performance we talked about splitting stuff Okay, I think the next stuff to do is the applied for images lazy loading. Uh, lazy loading, uh, for example, uh, we load some pins, but we don't display this, uh, p we don't render the image and trigger the image loading until the uh, browser is actually, uh, when the viewport actually intersects with these images. So we load this data lazily. Uh, okay, let's go to the rendering performance. So, what is the rendering performance? It's actually how we render this stuff. How we do. And the first thing to work with is to decrease the time to first content, uh, time to first content um, time. Okay, how can we do that? We inline the CSS and JS and I should add the critical. Critical, this means that uh, we inline the critical styles just inside the, in our HTML, and we do not block the rendering by loading this data. It's already have, uh, this data is already inside the uh, HTML, and this refers to the critical stuff like uh, main styles and main JavaScript we need to in order to render our application. So we inline it. We also can have the link rel preconnect. For the stuff we need uh, later in order to so to add the priority stuff. So for example, uh, give me a sec, then as resolve. So for the link preconnect, uh, this means that we preload some resources with the high priority. This means that the page is rendered, and then we load uh, other bundle like not uh, like the next bundle. We need to display the full application, and the link rel, uh, rel DNS resolve. This is actually good to use for analytics data. When, uh, in order to resolve the DNS, uh, DNS in advance and then load the, this uh, small bundle of analytics stuff later. We can also apply the... Uh, okay, we can also not uh, to in, uh, load the analytics on load analytics on load. So when the pro page is actually rendered then we load analytics data. This can increase, uh, decrease the time to first content stuff, but uh, we lose the like uh, users, which is actually just enter the page and closed. Sometimes it's important for business. In our case, I think it's not important, and we can apply this. So we load the analytics data just right after the uh, the whole application loaded, and we save time here. What else can we have? Uh, it also, we need to use the CSS naming. So what is the CSS naming? CSS naming is like a strategy how we name our CSS classes. Uh, the longer the selector is, uh, the worse the performance we have. 
and why it's important because uh, generally you have lots of selectors on the page and the browser should work with the, each of them and just applying the CSS naming strategy we can increase the rendering performance and this is very important uh, so okay what else can we for, have for a rendering it's so one thing one thing to add is to use placeholders so use placeholder uh, what means the placeholders for the image we can use the placeholder with some skeleton of the queen in order to uh, to give some user the progress of the loading. Some scientific research said that if the user see the placeholders of loading, it uh, decreases the time of loading this card. And uh, uh, we can improve just the user experience by applying this uh, placeholder, placeholder stuff. Okay, what else can we have? Hmm. So we talked about the user placeholders, also some critical stuff. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's it uh, for the rendering performance. Let's go to the JavaScript performance, and this is pretty obvious here uh, because with JavaScript we need to do less stuff. What means do less stuff? This means that we don't work to have any synchronous work which can block the all assets loading, uh, all uh, page loading. So the expensive work should be placed in the uh, asynchronous style. So this actually gives us a result that we need to do stuff async. What else can else be here? We can so cache cache high heavy work. So we cache the like heavy calculations, and also we can delegate the heavy calculations to the web workers, which can do this uh, on the background and then return the data to us in the synchronous manner. And we can cache it and then work and then work with it, and do not block the whole rendering. And I think that's uh, that's it. Um, can, what can else be added is that we need to enable the app, we need to enable the application loading. I mean, how can we in, uh, load the application even in the offline mode? So basically, what we need is the we we use the application cache. We cache the pin JavaScript, pin CSS, and some pin data and images, and we uh, with the service workers. So we. PMSX service workers. And with that, we use the service workers, which register it inside the user browser, and then we cache all this stuff and we can access it even in the fly mode. Okay, uh, I think we are done with the performance stuff and we can now do go to the accessibility. So accessibility. So let's focus on it. So we need to uh, to think about the keyboard navigation, like uh, shortcuts. So we can have the shortcut for adding pin, uh, going, go to top, go to bottom. We'll go to like share share the pin, also like the pin, and quick menu access, and help. This is the basic feature we want to have in our application. Also, we can add the uh, different color layout and different color color pinning in order to support people with a blind, uh, like color blindness. Uh, also, we can announce live fields with area life. 
So in the screen reader size, uh, the screen reader will dictate the whole changes inside, like this, like fields, uh, text boxes, or input, uh, or inputs uh, to the user, and this is very convenient. Also, we can use RAMs instead of pixels. And why it's important? Uh, sometimes the users have different um, browser settings. For example, it can have the increased. Uh, uh, zoom and the pixels doesn't scale, but the RAMs actually scale, and this will help us to prevent the situation if the user have different uh, sizings. Uh, so we adapt our text to the to the user like that. And I think this is the main points to work with, and we definitely can finish with it. So we have the like whole high level schema. We describe the uh, uh, the components architecture, we worked on the master layout, we worked on the data entities, on the data API, accessibility, performance, and data layers in store. So it took us 56 minutes and it's a lot. But on the interview, you're going to focus on, I think, on the one point, like on the master layout and performance, or on the API and the accessibility. So you, have, you will have less time for that. Okay, I think we're good. Uh, I'll attach the schema to the video itself. Uh, feel free to comment and uh, let's try to make this content better. Even if you have your opinion and it's you think that uh, here the design is dumb, uh, all comments are very welcome. So see you in the next videos and have a nice day and JavaScript. Bye.